The word gospel is from the Greek word evangelion, and it simply means good news or glad tidings. The word evangelist is from the Greek word evangelist, which is a form of the word evangelion and means a messenger of good news or a bearer of good tidings. Also, the word evangelizo is from the same form and it means to declare or to preach the good news. Our word gospel is from the Old English and it means good spell or good letters. Now, the word good spell is shortened to gospel and referred the spelling or letters uh, to form good words there. After the word gospel was so translated in the Old English versions, it came re to refer almost exclusively to the message concerning Christ in the kingdom. And so it is today. This morning I want us to look at the good news, to look at the gospel, and we're going to uh, think about some things pertaining to the good news. First of all, let's look at the good news as it is revealed in Scripture. The good news as it is revealed in Scripture. The first instances we see about the good news comes from the prophets in the Old Testament. Specifically in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 40, verses 9 through 11. O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, you who bring good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, lift it up, be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand and his arms shall rule for him. Behold, his reward. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. We're told in this verse that the good news would come from Jerusalem in verse 9. The good news was that the Lord would come with a strong arm. To aid his people, verse 10. The good news was that God would shepherd his flock and that God would lead his flock in verse 11. So we see the uh, scripture, the Old Testament scripture talking about the good news. Let's go on to Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah chapter 61 uh, verses 1 through 4 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified, and they shall rebuild the old ruins. They shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. The Messiah would preach good tidings to the poor, he would heal the brokenhearted. He would proclaim liberty to the captives and free the prisoners. You know, we know that that's just what Jesus did. He came to do all of these things, and we see it talked about, that good news in Scripture. In the next verse, we turn over to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, I didn't put this on the screen because it is a little more lengthy. In Luke chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, cloths lying in a manger. 
And suddenly there was with, with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. The words bring you good tidings in verse 10. This is from that Greek word evangelizo, which means declare good news or announce the gospel. The long awaited for Messiah who was going to bring all of these blessings had now been born. And it's told to be the good news. When Jesus began preaching his ministry, we see in Mark chapter 1, he began preaching the good news of the kingdom. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Again, everywhere you see that word gospel is the word literally meaning good news. Christ comes out, he begins preaching the good news of the kingdom. And he showed that he was fulfilling the prophets. Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 22. So he came to Nazareth, uh, where he had been brought up. And as he, the, his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. He was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set a liberty at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? Prophecy. Talking about him coming to preach the good news. To preach the good news to the people. And he says it is fulfilled. The death, burial, resurrection, and the appearances of Jesus form the basis of the gospel. We see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Starting in verse 1, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I had re also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that He arose, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, that He was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that He was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the presence, present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. You see that the death, the burial, the resurrection, the appearances of Jesus, all of these things fulfilled the scriptures. All of these things matched what was given. You know, there was a promise that was made to the, to the fathers. And in Acts chapter 13... Verse 32 through 34, we see that that promise was fulfilled. We declare to you glad tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, that he has raised up Jesus. As it is also written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He has spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. 
we understand that that prophecy was made, that promise was made to the fathers and it was fulfilled. The good news, the glad tidings, those things which are being taught and preached. Secondly, when we look at the good news, we look at the good news of Christ. It is called the good news of Christ. The glad tidings of Christ. We see this 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 11. It says, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. The glorious gospel. The glorious glad tidings. That gospel came by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 1 verses 10 through 12. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. So it is called the glorious gospel or the good news of Jesus Christ, first of all, because he came by his revelation. It was given by him. Also, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. It is the power of God to salvation. This good news, this glad tidings that came by the revelation of Jesus Christ, that is the power that leads us to salvation. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 5. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. This gospel, this glad tidings that was revealed by Jesus Christ brings light to all who will receive it. In 1995, there was a document written or an article written called Jane's International Defense Review. And it reported that a company in China was offering to export a weapon that used laser beams to damage the eyes of enemies. The weapon was called the ZM-87 Portable Laser Disturber. And it had a range of two miles. You could stand two miles away, shine it into the eyes of your enemies, and cause them to not be able to see well enough to help you in your battle. According to the Chicago Tribune, James said the company stated that one of its major applications was to injure or dizzy the eyes of an enemy combatant with high-powered laser pulses, especially anybody who was sighting or trying to fire a weapon uh, by means of using like an optical instrument, some kind of a scope. You could shine that in and cause it to not work. They would lose that combat ability. They would result in making it where they couldn't observe and they couldn't sight. They couldn't do what they needed to do. I say all of that as an example because that's exactly what Satan tries to do to us. Satan knows that blinding a soldier renders him worthless for battle. Satan understands that if we are blinded, if he puts all these weapons up in front of us, he puts all these things up in front of us that cause our attention to deviate off of the gospel, that we will be blinded and then he can get us. We have to understand that the gospel is the light. The gospel brings light to those who receive it, and we need to keep our focus on it. Not get distracted by anything else. I make the comment here when we talk about doing our Bible study, and we talk about studying in our own lives. Books are great. Books help a lot, but we have to understand and remember that books are written by man. And we can't get distracted with the books to where we get distracted from God's Word. The point is to keep our focus on God's Word. To keep our focus on 
the good news. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9 says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Life and immortality are brought to light through it. When we look at the good news, we understand our life. We understand the purpose of our life. We also understand that we will not die spiritually. And that is all brought to light. Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. And he said to them, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. We see the scope here of the gospel. We see the scope of the good news. He tells them, go into all the world and preach the gospel. This isn't something that is subject just to certain individuals, one person, one group of people. This is something that is subject to the entire world. So we see when we look at uh, the gospel, it is from Christ, it is brought from the revelation of Christ It is the power of God to salvation. It brings light to those who receive it. We see life. We understand life. We understand immortality. All of that is brought to light through it, and it is for all men. Now, as we're studying the good news, we're studying the gospel, we also want to look at and understand that the good news, this term, is an Old Testament expression. It is an expression that comes to us from the Old Testament. And this comes from 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 7 and verse 9. It says, Then they said to one another, We are not doing right. This day is a day of good news, and we remain silent. If we wait until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. Now therefore come, let us go and tell the king's household. When you look at this section, we look at the context of what is spoken here. The Syrians had besieged Samaria. The Syrians had come in, they besieged Samaria, and all the people of the city were starving. The situation had gotten so bad, and it gotten really bad, that we see in chapter 6 and verse 25 that a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and one-fourth of a cab of dove droppings for five shekels of silver. In other words, they were getting donkey's heads and the poo from doves to eat. They were selling it to eat. That's how bad it had gotten. So then you have, I mean, I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound real appetizing. But they were eating what they had. That's how bad it got. And in the context, and you see, um, you see in 2 Kings 7, 1, Elisha said, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Tomorrow about this time a sea of fine flour will be sold for a shekel and two seas of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. Elisha comes forward and he says, The price is about to drop. Why? Because it's going to be in abundance. This time, tomorrow. In other words, the siege is going to be over. You're going to be able to get the food that you need. You're going to be able to have the things that you need. You're going to be able to do the things that you need to do. This is a day of good news. A day of glad news. Tidings, the glad tidings that this famine would be over, the glad tidings that uh, these problems uh, would go away. Now, there were four lepers who reasoned that if they went into the city, they would die, and if they just sat there, they would die. So they decided to go to the army of the Syrians, thinking perhaps the Syrians will keep them alive. And we see that. In 2 Kings chapter 7, verses 4 and 5, if we say, we'll enter the city, the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. 
And if we sit here, we die also. Now therefore come, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. If they keep us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall only die. They rose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, nobody was there. We're going to die. Let's just go turn ourselves over to the Syrians. They go and there's nobody there. So in verses 6 and 7, For the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses, the noise of a great army. So they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to attack us. Therefore they arose and fled at twilight and left the camp intact, their tents, their horses, and their donkeys, and they fled for their lives. The lepers began to enjoy themselves with all the bounty that was there. And after a while, they said, we're not doing what is right. This is a day of good news. And we remain silent. So they go back into the city and they told the news to the people. And the people went out and gathered the spoils. There was so much food. There were so many many animals that they were able to eat that they were able to do things. So when we look at the Old Testament and we look at what it was talking about when it said the good news, the good news that the people would live, the good news that the people would not have their captors there, that they would no longer be surrounded, that they would no longer have to pay exorbitant prices for the grossest things you could imagine to eat. The good news that God had delivered them. So let's think about this Old Testament uh, way that the words are used and let's look at application for us today. What does it mean for us today? This is a day of good news and we will not remain silent is what Scripture says and we need to be saying that. We must call upon the Lord to be saved, but how can they call upon anybody that they have not been taught about? Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 18. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. The order here is... Preacher needs to be sent. Preacher needs to be heard. Then people will believe and the people will call on the name of the Lord. And then they will be saved. Now this isn't talking about me, the preacher, standing up here preaching to you, although it is. But it's not just me. It's talking about each and every one of us. How do the people of this world... How are they going to know and understand the good news if we don't tell them about it? Obedience is part of it. I've got to obey. I've got to learn. I've got to do what I need to do. But then I need to tell others about it. I should be so excited about this good news in the gospel. Think about the shepherds when Jesus is born. How excited they are. And the first thing they think of is we're going to leave our sheep here because we've got to go see him. What about these lepers as they're sitting down and probably haven't eaten in quite a bit of time. And they see all these fools and they sit down to start eating and feeling better. And then they look at each other and say, we can't keep this to ourselves. This is incredible news. We've got to go tell somebody. And we do that with all kinds of things, but we don't do it with the gospel. When you have a grandbaby on the way and you find out you're about to get another grandbaby, what do you do? You tell people about it. 
or a great-grandchild. What did we do when we had our first child and how excited we were when we were going to have our first child and you wanted to tell everybody the good news? Somebody's going to get married and they want to tell everybody they're getting married. You get a new job and you tell your family, you tell your friends, I got a new job. When we have good news, we want to share it and we want to tell it. But here we've had the best news that could ever happen. The best news that ever comes and we don't say a word. Well, my religion's your religion, your faith, your faith. We don't get involved in that. I should be so excited about being a Christian that I want others to be the same. I want them to be a Christian with me and I want to share it. And that's part of it. We have to share it because that's the only way that they're going to obey it. They have to hear it first. They have to hear it and understand it. And we understand 1 Peter chapter 4 verses 17 and 18. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? We understand that without obedience to the gospel, there is no salvation. If someone has not obeyed the gospel, they are not saved. And we know that punishment will be rendered. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. And to give you who are troubled rest with us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Punishment will be rendered to those who do not obey. Obedience to the gospel involves more than just the first principles. It involves more than, you know, it involves faith, repentance, confession, baptism. (coughs) All of those things come together for obedience. What about 2 Corinthians 9 verse 13? While through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and with all men. This is talking about distributing to Members of the church who didn't have enough, who had need. We're obeying the gospel when we, when we distribute things to them. It doesn't stop at just the act of becoming a Christian. It talks about all of these things that wrap up together to form obedience. We have to tell them about it. They have to hear about it so that they can hear it. They can be part uh, of the gospel. And part of that obedience also is that we have to preach it. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 16, For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Paul's talking about himself here, but this applies to each and every one of us. Rudyard Kipling, you've probably heard of him, wrote a few books in his time. He was on a world tour. And at one of the ports, General Booth boarded the ship. He was sent off by a horde of tambourine-beating Salvationists. The whole thing revolted Kipling's soul. And he got to know the general and told him how much he disapproved of this kind of show, of this kind of thing. Young man, said Booth, if I thought that I could win one more soul for Christ by standing on my hands and beating a tambourine with my feet, I would learn to do it. The real enthusiast does not care if others think he is a fool for doing the things he does. The point here is we have to preach the gospel. 
We should be doing anything and everything that we can to get the good news out to the people around us. How many of your friends do you know of that are not saved? How many of your family members do you know of that are not saved? How many people do you come in contact with on a daily or weekly basis that you know are not saved? We need to be preaching the gospel. Doesn't mean I have to sit down and have a sermon with them while I'm sitting there, but how do I act? What are some of the things that I do? What are some of the conversation pieces I bring up? What are some of the things I talk about? Because sometimes we can just slip a little thing in and it's enough to get somebody thinking. The point is, we need to be doing it. We have to be sharing the gospel because if we're not, we're dying out. And we are not obeying the gospel. We're not obeying God's word. Because why? He tells us to preach and teach. You know, the four lepers said this is a day of good news and we remain silent. We need to be saying this is a day of good news and we will not remain silent. It is not just the job of the preacher of a congregation to spread the word. It is not just the job of the missionaries that we support in different places all over the world to spread the gospel. It is a command that is given to each and every one of us. We have all kinds of tools to do it. It may be an email. It may be the house-to-house -house that goes out in the mail. It may be the, some of the uh, material we have sitting back there in the back. Maybe you hear of something going on in somebody's life. Guess what? There's probably one of those tracks back there that fits that situation. We have a track for just about every subject matter back there. And if they're not back there, then you know what? I've got a pile about this tall sitting at home that we can probably go through and I can find you something. And sometimes that's all it takes. Something that somebody can read to help them get through the situation they're going on in, going through in life. You know, Brother Neil had a great thought about our food pantry next door. At least as they walk out the door, we need to invite them to come visit us some Sunday. The point of that is to help our community and let them see what it means to be a Christian. And hopefully to bring people at some point in time to the church. We need to be doing everything we can to spread the gospel. When I teach a sermon like this, I'm stepping on my toes just as much as anybody else's because it's very hard to have these conversations many times with people that are friends or family. It's very hard to step on their toes and try to tell somebody or show somebody that they're not right with God. But we have to talk to people. We have to spread the gospel. We understand what it means to be a Christian. We've looked at that, but if you are not a Christian, you've got to be a Christian first and foremost. You've got to take care of your life. And that means that you hear the word of God. Somebody's taught it to you. You've heard it somewhere. You believe on it. You Repent of your sins, and we understand that repenting of those sins means that I turn away from them, I turn a different direction. I confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I confess that He is the Son of God, and that I'm baptized for the remission of my sins. And then it doesn't stop there. It says that I live faithfully unto death, which means I follow all the commandments to the best of my ability that God has told me to do. And we know that we stumble, we fall, we mess up. We have problems and God says, come to me. Repent of those sins. I will forgive you. We know that we can always go to our Father in heaven and repent of those sins and he will forgive us and help us. Let's share the word of God. Let's make sure that we are bringing other people to him. And if we can help you in any way this morning, please come as we stand and sing.